Welcome to Carnegie Political Podcast. My name is Alexander Gabuyev. I'm director of Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center in Berlin. We're going to talk about Putin's war economy and the Russian budget that the Kremlin is rolling out this week. The Russian government is announcing the major figures of the budget. And to discuss that, the state of the Russian economy and the medium and long term trajectory, I'm joined today by two excellent economists, some of the leading voices on the Russian economic policy. Carnegie's very own Alexander Prokopenko, former senior advisor at the Russian Central Bank and fellow at Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center in Berlin. Welcome, Sasha. Hi. And Alexander Kalyarner, who is a non-resident senior fellow at SIPA and has a very long and illustrious career covering Russian economies in major Western media, including Wall Street Journal and investment banking, including Credit Suisse. Welcome, Alexander. Hello. Let's start hand on. What do we know about the new Russian budget and what are the major figures in it? I remember that a year ago when the budget for 2024 was introduced that had really the record high military expenditures uh, and the planning for year of 25 and 26 was that military expenditures will go down. A lot of analysts said, well, that's the peak of the Russian military expenditures. They cannot afford to spend so much on national security and defense. And it's only natural that these figures are all going down. But what we know by now is that instead of going down, the military expenditures are actually going up. So What's caught your eye, Alexander? What's really important in the new budget? Well, I would say the most important in this budget is that the Russian government continues to spend a lot of funds on tanks and missiles and whatnot, on defense and military, that it actually increases its military spending, both in nominal terms and as a share of the GDP, we see a constant rise of the share of the Russian economy spent on the war. And what is probably the most exciting part of all that is that the Russian government is still able to afford it. So just think about that. We are entering the third year of the war. Russian defense or military spending is expected to overshoot 6% of the GDP next year, despite all the promises that it would go down. And the budget deficit, you know, this problem of uh, every single country at war, is only half percent of the GDP. So Russia is able to increase its military spending and is also able to support its economy without causing any internal problem, at least on paper. Alexander, the increase in the military budget, is it coming at the expense of something else? Like are other expenditures or healthcare infrastructure cut, or they are more or less the same and the Russian government is just spending more on defense? Well, there is a decline at the share of the GDP in almost everything, like social spending and media support, medicine, what what not. So yes, there is a decline, but it is not anywhere as crucial as the decline, say, in the late 80s or the early 90s. So it's it's a pretty mild decline in social spending, but there is still social spending. And as far as I can see, the Russian government is able to spend more on the war because it believes that it will earn more money next year. So it's kind of a combination. We spend a little bit less on not military stuff, but we also expect to get more money next year. Uh, May I jump in here and uh, 
clarify that it seems that government is going to increase military expenditures from non-oil and gas revenues. And mostly non-oil and gas revenues in 2025, which are jump up to 73%, it's tax increase introduced in 2024. So basically, this addition of uh, military spending would be paid by people and corporates, not because there were some extra money produced by the economy. So it was a political decision to increase taxes and these increased taxes and also inflationary tax because the economy generates additional VAT tax because of inflation. All this increase will go to additional military spending, not into healthcare or social policy or education or even infrastructure. We already see the decline in state spending on road construction, on bridge construction, and on restoration of utilities infrastructure, which actually cries being underfinanced for years. And that's the problem. If I may, just to sum it up. So the increased military spending is coming from effectively several sources. One of them is slashing non-military spending, as Alexandra has just said. Secondly, it comes from higher corporate and income taxes introduced in 2024. So it comes in force next year. And thirdly, it comes from a sheer fact that the Russian economy is growing. So when you see a growing economy, you effectively see a higher amount of collected taxes, be it a VAT sales tax, or any other tax that a growing economy produces. So three sources, less money on roads, bridges, and infrastructure, more money from new taxes, and more money from the growing economy. Sasha Prokopienko, you were one of the very few economists who early last year predicted that the government will have fiscal room to increase the military budget in 2025. And when many people said like, oh, Russia is at the peak of its defense spending and uh, the goal for, for example, Ukrainian armed forces is really to reduce the Russian gains on the battlefield to marginal wins and uh, that at the top of the Russian military spending. And then probably in 2025, Mr. Putin will realize that he doesn't have fiscal room to continue to finance this war and he will start to crawl out of the hole that he has dug for himself. You were the one who was saying like, oh, wait a minute, they actually will find the money to not only finance the war in 2024 levels, but also increase that. So if you remember the movie Scurps, you have all the right to dance the I told you so dance. I told you so, I told you so, I told you so. Very nice. And indeed you did. So here is my question to you. What is your expectation now, a Prokopenko prophecy, on how much fiscal space they will have for how many years? Like, is it, again, a one-off or is it something that we are likely to see in the medium term, let's say next year and next two years? And I know like the war, it's all contingent and there are too many moving elements on the table, but like your best guess. Sasha, thanks for the question. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball and I don't have all data provided by Finman to calculate for their expenses. But what's obvious and clear for me that Russia is entering a period of strategic restructuring of its arms forces, which, according to our dear colleague Dara Masikot, could last up to eight years, from eight to ten it doesn't mean that the whole time frame from eight to 10 years, uh, military expenditures will remain elevated. But for coming year or two, the military needs replenishment of personnel and weapon stocks. Civil enterprises and facilities need air defense and electronic warfare systems for, for defense against drones since the war is going on and we don't see ending of this unfair and bloody war. So in previous two years, the Kremlin coped by partial mobilization, repairing existing equipment and attracting new recruits with high payments. 
We all uh, we also know that Russia increased production capacity at existing defense plants, and they are operating 24-7, well, basically on their maximum capacity, meeting uh, the needs of the war against Ukraine. However, with the exception of drone production, these efforts have reached their limits by early 2024. This means that military industry complex requires additional investments and there is no other sources except state budget where these investments could come from. So, so long as the Kremlin has stable commodity revenues and a competent economic team, and actually we shouldn't underestimate the increased repression at home, it may well continue to finance the conduct of the war or the large-scale rebuilding of military capacities for the foreseeable future. So my best guess is that for coming 12, 18 months, Putin has enough resources at his disposal to continue what he's doing. But we already, from this budget draft, see that for the Kremlin, it become harder and harder to manage all three variables of the equation. So continue to spend money on military, continue to sustain social payments, which increased heavily during the last 2.5 years, and work on macroeconomic stability since inflation accelerating and double-digit key rate helps a little to tame it. Thanks, Alexander. And that's the trilemma that uh, you wrote about uh, in January in the foreign affairs. So you cannot maintain an equilibrium between the increased military spending high social payments and obligation and maintaining the macroeconomic stability, low inflation, and low debt, at some point the trade-offs will kick in. And we'll talk about that. But I have a question to Alexander. How do you explain that despite all of the sanctions, the oil price cap, the increased transaction costs to clear payments, because we hear from many business people that sometimes transaction costs constitute up to 10% of the price that's already included there, because like clearing a payment between Russia and China is really very complicated because of the sanctions. How do you explain that the Russian budget still has enough commodity and other revenues? What are the key ingredients here that the incoming cash flow is still net positive and sufficient to finance the war effort? Well, I would probably say that it's a divine intervention. Unfortunately, it's much more humane. Well, first of all, as we've heard so many times from the horse's mouth, uh, basically from Mr. Putin himself, Russia is fighting the global economic and political order, and he's trying to amass support for his crusade against the global economy. However, it's the same global economy that effectively saves him and his budget. So Russia is able to sell its uh, oil and gas to the non, let's call them non-aligned states, In other words, the states that do not support the sanctions regime, with a certain ease. It wasn't possible back in the, I would say, 70s, when Western sanctions and embargoes left the Soviet Union with nowhere to go. Now, the power of um, procurement of the Russian oil, effectively the global oil, is not concentrated only in the Western world. Technology is also not concentrated there. So Russia is able to sell its oil to other places to procure microchips or AR the machinery from other places. Effectively, it's the same European and American microchips, which are now exported to countries like Turkey, China, the United Arab Emirates, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and the rest. And from there, they nicely travel to Russia and find their place in Russian military and production facilities. And I would say it's a combination of a lukewarm attitude towards the sanctions, the uh, globalized economy, which Russia is 
promising to fight, but which it also greatly enjoys. And the overall desire of the Western politicians not to cause any financial trouble on their population because of Russia. So all that combined leaves uh, Russia with a pretty sizable oil revenue. If I'm not mistaken, it's still about one third of the state budget revenue. It also keeps Russian economy running on expensive, but not outrageously expensive, imported, important components, microchips and the rest. And the economy is still going on despite the sanctions. And there is another part of the sanctions story which we somehow do not mention, which is capital flow, or rather the lack of it. So if you look back to the years when uh, I was young and you were extremely young, for years Russia ran pretty sizable trade surplus. In other words, it was able to sell more oil and gas and spend only part of that money on imported, uh, I don't know, cars, uh, washing machines, microchips, and the rest. To keep this balance, Russia had a huge capital outflow. In other words, people were buying dollars, people were buying property abroad, people were traveling abroad for their holidays or city breaks, and they were even buying foreign stocks and shares. When the war started in Ukraine, all that suddenly stopped. So Russia was left with a trade surplus and a pretty small capital outflow. So basically the sanctions without, or the engineers of those sanctions, without really, I would say, planning that, locked up capital inside Russia, which allowed the Russian economy to pay for more expensive imported goods and to keep uh, the war machine going. So I think that uh, when we are looking back at the sanctions regime, that was one of the mistakes which allowed Russia to continue its economic flourishing despite the sanctions and the war. And there is absolutely nothing, you know, bizarre, strange or unique in an economy growing amid the war. If you look back at any large war and any large country waging that war, you'll see an economic growth, especially at the beginning towards the middle of the war, because the state spends more, economy runs at full throttle, produces more products, returns more taxes. So whenever there is a war, there is usually growth of the economy. Well, unless you have carpet bombing of uh, everything around you. Thanks, Sasha. I think that in your writings, you also focus a lot on the structural limitations to the economy, because the key rate that's in double digits, very close to 20%, doesn't signal a very healthy economy. There is also a question of availability of workforce, given how much the front lines pool military age men, but that's also men who could work uh, in factories, in construction, and in many areas where Russia really needs labor. Could you talk about what, in your view, constitutes the major uh, lines where the Russian economy still feels constrained? What are the constraint factors? And whether the Kremlin and your contacts in the Russian government, in the Bank of Russia, are aware of those limitations and how they plan to cope with them? Well, great question. So there are two serious limitations to Putin's current economic model. First, an internal one, as you correctly mentioned, is labor market, which is extremely tight. And the external one, the second one, is our sanctions. So the literal absence of workers on the market with unemployment rate, which now I think 2.4% or even 23 where is the button, will hamper the ability of military industry complex to increase output, despite the new capacities that have been put in place. 
Sanctions limit the possibilities of technical re-equipment of enterprises, hinder the import of components, and, well, they are actually become a bottleneck in terms of transactions. So all these developments now looks to me like borrowing from the future generations, but it's also clear that the Kremlin does not see this as a problem. So the constant injection of money into army and the security forces exacerbate existing imbalances in the Russian economy. And so simply put, the Russian leadership prefers to build up military power instead of uh, taking care of long-term economic stability. But the Kremlin's logic here looks like when the problems start, we will solve them then. And there are also a group of consistent supporters um, in government circles of the idea of a demand management through the budget channel, where military spending will be the main driver of economic growth. And because of the figures of economic growth right now, they have um, some sort of approval that they are right. And look, we are fulfilling economy with the money by... Uh, military industry complex, and we see growth, uh, which Russia economy haven't felt since recovering from the global financial crisis. So it is a quite powerful group, including industry lobbyists uh, like Manturov and Chemizov, who are direct beneficiaries of uh, this budget spending, and economists among Russian economic bloc like Maxim Areshkin, Defense Minister Andrei Belousov is a strong supporter of this idea. I think Alexei Dumin also likes this. So actually, they are powerful voices. And Silvanov, who wants balanced budget, and Nabiulina, governor of the central bank who is in charge of inflation, they are not able to have a real solid pushback to this group. So one thing which I want to point that put the rest of the economy along to increased military demand requires constant or better growing demand on the output of military industry complex. And the ongoing war with Ukraine is one of the factors of such demand. Restoration of military potential could be another one, but any domestic demand for a defense industry is finite and we can calculate when it ends. And uh, well, good news here that it's not indefinite. And export prospects for a defense industry, I think they are quite grim given the expanding sanctions. So export couldn't work on smugglers, on schemes and on constant pressure on transactions. So consequently, once the domestic demand is exhausted, the economy will face another shock and another structural reorganization. So basically, Kremlin now puts economy on the path of potential artificial crisis in the coming five or seven years. And just one more thing, probably uh, this never sound on this podcast, but it's very important for policymakers and for everyone to understand that end of the war doesn't mean end of military spending. So this will remain elevated regardless of ending the war. And that's uh, what Europeans and U.S. allies of Ukraine need to be prepared. Thanks. And I think that you both agree that Western sanctions play a role and could play a role. Alexander, you have written a very interesting piece a couple of days ago for Carnegie Politica. West seeks to increase the cost of Russia sanctions evasion, where you talk about the mechanism that the West is trying to put in place for making the sanctions more efficient. And we will put the link in the show notes. What's your view of what the Western governments could do better on the sanctions front to make this crisis that Alexandra is talking about, to shift it a little bit to the left and to make it sooner, constraining the resources available to Mr. Putin in waging his criminal war against Ukraine and confronting the Russian government with the really hard trade-offs that would not favor increased war spending? I would probably have a twofold answer. One of them would be a little bit wider and another part will be much more precise. So first of all, if you look back at what Adam Smith and the founding father of the modern economy was writing almost 300 years ago, uh, he famously said that uh, there are three main sources of production. 
And here we are talking about the land and its, its uh, resources, capital, and labor. So to target Russia and to make Russian economy less capable of supporting this criminal war, I think the Western countries should read Adam uh, Smith, rather reread it, and target those three pillars. Land and resources means, in the Russian case, more targeted sanctions against revenue from exported oil. And that can be achieved by tightening sanctions against shadow fleet and imposing more transaction costs, basically to make Russian oil revenue a little bit less. Secondly, when it comes to labor, the West should, in my view, target all the expert that increases productivity, uh, be it the newest software or some super sophisticated machinery for production. And it also, I think, should target Russian labor market, offering effectively emigration for those specialists, especially when it comes to the IT engineers, scientists, and people like that, offering them some employment outside of Russia despite their perceived support of the regime or annexation of Crimea. It doesn't matter from the point of view of the economic equation. Taking them out of the labor market and taking their abilities away from Russia would definitely increase costs. And thirdly, something should be done to facilitate capital outflow from Russia. On a much more narrow agenda, I think what uh, the European Union and the United States are doing at the moment is fighting the circumvention of uh, technological export is the right thing to do. They basically are targeting, in the case of the United States, they are targeting financial go-betweeners and financial companies that facilitate illegal export of technology to Russia. And in the European case, and, you know, Europe is usually pretty lukewarm to any kind of secondary sanctions. But Europe is able, and that's what they are doing. They task their own exporters, their own companies, with due diligence and responsibility to make sure that their export going to another country would not end up uh, in Russia. So I would say if there is a Western government who is ready to listen to my advice, in order to make Putin struggling with financing the war, you should address capital, labor market, and Russian oil revenue. And when it comes to protecting the export sanctions, just target the most important parts of it target the technological export, not the luxury goods, and target the exporters with the task of, you know, being responsible for uh, the end users. Thank you so much, Alexander Kalyander, the non-resident senior fellow at SIPA, and Alexandra Prokopienka, a fellow at the Carnegie Russia Eurasia Center and our leading in-house economist. My major takeaway from this pretty sobering and grim conversation is that Vladimir Putin will have money to finance this war for the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, he is riding a wave of expanding economy, which is not unique to Russia. And many of the economies throughout history that are waging the war are experiencing this uh, wartime expansion. Uh, he has a pretty favorable external environment. He has buyers for his goods, but uh, there are mounting internal structural constraints that will push this economy into the wall. And the West has a lot of agency in designing the sanctions the way that the cost of prosecuting this criminal war will come faster to Russia. And then the Kremlin will have to face some very painful choices that hopefully will reduce its appetite to continue to pound Ukrainian cities with deadly missiles and bombs 
we'll have to continue this conversation. I'm very grateful for you for finding the time to join me and please stay safe.